So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that Pepe Sasso couldn't be here today. He was originally meant to talk. He's tied up in New Zealand and he couldn't get away. But I'd like to thank him for all the assistance he's provided in putting this talk together. The first thing I'd really like to bring to your attention is that radiation oncology is successful. It treats a lot of people, a large percentage of the Australian and the international population, and they survive. And the interesting thing about survivorship, particularly with a disease like cancer, is that people can return for retreatment, which arguably means that you are no longer treating, let's say, a greenfield site. And you've got to understand what has been done prior to then go forward again and treat with radiotherapy again. And this again is continuously impacted by technology, the ability to deliver radiation to a tight location with a high degree of accuracy, but also knowing where to treat it, which then pulls in the imaging side. And then how do we know that the plan which is being put together by a planning computer is actually being delivered accurately? And what are the inputs into the planning computer so that it can actually deliver appropriately? And if we put all that together, we end up with a more complex space, which means if we think about the concept of justification, we need to understand the impacts which are informing the decision and whether and how the clinician obtains a relatively useful, appropriate understanding of the detriments and benefits which are going to be applied in the decision to treat and decision on how to treat. So just to de um, demonstrate the survivorship, this is data out of the US. Thank you to Flora Van Leeuwen, who has put a lot of this together. And over the preceding years and going into the future, we're having a far greater number, percentage of uh, people fronting up for radiotherapy who've actually been previously treated. And these previous treatments might have happened over a decade ago. And if we look at this out of the Netherlands data, we have subsequent cancers being diagnosed in a person who has been previously treated. And so we have this concept of where are we treating, what are we treating, and what was treated prior. And so if we have this example of a patient who was treated in uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, a fairly standard approach, the blocks in the middle, the light blue section, are lead alloy blocks which are used to stop radiation. They block it out, that's what they're there for. But down the line, 20 years later, you find a lump. And the question is if we're going to treat this with radiation, what actually happened? What's the radiation impact, the historical radiation impact to that site historically? Because it's rather difficult to put up a modern treatment technique without understanding exactly what happened 20 years ago. So we have technology, we have computer algorithms, we also have what type of data has actually been stored by a facility which will allow that question to be answered. And if we expand this into Hodgkin's lymphoma and testicular cancer, we have similar sort of questions where large quadrants of the body can actually be treated, which is completely adjacent to areas of the body. into which secondary cancers or future primary cancers could occur. So it's rather difficult to understand or to establish what is the radiological history of the patient which is needed to inform an appropriate treatment. And just to drive this a bit harder, we're now looking at technology changes here. On the left, we have a field in uh, the late 1980s. The top right, we have a more block-defined field. And here we're moving into a, an MLC, a multi-leaf collimator-defined field which, as you can see, can more tightly define the mass which is desired to be treated. So if you want to treat this patient again 10 years down the track, it's pretty much essential to know which one of these approaches was used historically and what the radiation distribution inside the patient was for that treatment. Of course, we also need to recognise, and this is also demonstrated in the evidence, that reducing the field, whoop, sorry, reducing the field size has a distinct reduction in long-term breast cancer risk. So here we're now talking about the success of the advantages of technology being applied in the clinic to reduce the overall radiation burden to the patient. And if we look about this uh, from different approaches, this can also be difficult, uh, different in different countries and different facilities. We need to unpack this with a patient to understand where the radiation has been delivered 
into a patient so that if we need to go and treat again, what was actually done. I'm going to have a little bit of a talk about integral dose. So we're talking about the total dose distributed through an organ, integrated over the entire organ. If we move from left to right, we're talking older technology on the far left, which is linear accelerator beams pretty much aimed in parallel at each other to irradiate a mass in the middle, identified by the red blob, but a great deal of the entire brain has been picked up. As we move into three-dimensional treatment, we use a five-field treatment, and you can see the dose distribution can now be distributed more across different parts of the brain and the head to where the radiation oncologist and the advising clinical team thinks that it should be. So we're now seeing the impact of radiation sensitivity of different organs and how radiation dose can begin to be sculpted to maximally put the dose into where we want it and avoid organs at risk to as great extent as possible and as appropriate, ensuring the dose is still being delivered to the treatment volume. And here we're looking at forward technology right up to protons. And here you can see the dose wash throughout the rest of the head is less. And this is um, Professor Murphy attended to earlier, is an indication and one of the great arguments for protons is that there is a lesser dose distribution throughout the non-target area. Similar example, if we're treating, let's say, right side parotid, we have a vo uh, volume modulated whoop, therapy where you have a dose wash extending across midline, proton therapy, and now we have this technique called 4pi. Now, 4pi is exactly what it says. You have a robot mounted uh, either a short length accelerator on one of the robots that you normally see painting cars. You put a LINAC on the end of that. You also have the patient being on a bed that can rotate and you end up with many degrees of freedom which allows you to dump dose pretty much where you want it and avoid where you can. And so you have all these technologies at the same time all pretty much competing in the space. And this is deliberately complex. What we now get is what's called a dose volume histogram of the dose being delivered across all the organs which have been delineated inside the human anatomy. And so to understand where the radiation is being delivered historically, you really need a plot of something like this to, want to get a better picture, while recognising that this plot doesn't tell you where in the organ, just that the organ itself has an integral distribution. And if you want to drive it really hard, we can now segment individual organs and recognise there's individual radio sensitivities for different parts of, say, the heart. And then we start talking about patient movement, we're talking about uh, deformation of anatomies, the heart beats while the patient is being treated, haven't really got a technique to stop the heart beating while treated. And so we have movement. Now if we talk in more and more accurate fields, we can actually treat two centimetre wide fields, which we'll come to, recognising this level of specificity and accuracy is becoming more important. So an automatic heart contour can actually do this in about 10 minutes and provide all the different segments and the actual dose as calculated by the planning computer. Note the reliance on the accuracy of the planning computer. So what's happening in Australia? Halcyon is a 6MV uh, accelerator guide mounted in pretty much CT uh, gantry. Cyberknife uh, is a, an isotope mounted, tomotherapy is a similar x-ray tube mounted in a clamshell in a CT gantry. Gamma knife um, is a short band accelerator on a robot head like this. MR Linux have now been installed. One has now been installed at Townsville. It is accurate, so we are treating radiotherapy at the same time as about a half, no, I think a quarter Tesla field. So that's going on at the same time. And protons are a work in progress. So how are we ensuring that we understand what the dose is in all these new therapies while also keeping an idea of what happened in the old ones? And so one of these techniques is to actually audit. And here we have the ACDS clinical team in play out on there in the field measuring fields to demonstrate they're actually doing what they intend to do. And we'll just use this as a test case. So this is stereotactic radiosurgery. 
where we are delivering small fields delineated by the contour, ah, there in the lung, left to right, soft tissue, spine and lung. Soft tissue is defined as soft tissue in that it's a fairly homogeneous phantom, so it's less, in, uh, shall we say, difficult for the plant computer to get it right. Notice we're delivering 43 gray and three, fra three fractions, so we're talking 15 gray per fraction. Consequence of this is that you can't really afford to get it wrong even once. Old school, if you had 30 fractions, you've got a potential for recovery. If you're dealing with three, you can't. Spine in the middle, 24 gray and two fractions. Lung, 48 gray and four fractions. So these are audits in real time, which are now being worked up. So let's just look at one of them, the spine. So this is a real case. And as you can see, that is the, on the left, the dose profile as measured by the film which is in the middle and the two contour lines for two dose profiles have been taken through that film. The one in particular we're interested in is this vertical going through the image on the left because we have a discrepancy here which is a difference between what the planning computer predicts and what has been measured. And what we find out here that we're looking about a 13% difference between calculation and measurement in an area just below the spinal cord, between the spinal processes, which is hot. And it's hot because this particular algorithm underestimates the dose just downstream from a piece of bone. And because the calculation underestimates the dose, it puts more units, if you will, more dose into that space because it's got room to move against whatever limitation parameters that have been set up in the planning process. So this was an out of tolerance outcome. We are investigating this in particular and see if it relates to this algorithm. And the strength of having a national program is that you can look across all the commercial pro, all the algorithms that are in play and see if there is bias and behavior characteristic of providers. And in, the, in these cases, we have found these to be true. So we're looking at putting together a publication that basically looks at the different uh, efficacy, accuracy of different Monte Carlo calculators. So the other thing we need to recognize is that it's rare that a single error is responsible for the entire um, inaccuracy of a planning computer, if there is one, or a system, but there's often accumulation of small errors, which if they all drive in the same direction, can result in our tolerance outcome. So another lesson that we have now for pretty much all radiotherapy providers to address the errors you can because there are ones you probably won't be aware of and they can have a cumulative effect to pick up what you can work on. So just to sort of demonstrate a real in-clinic example of the rate at which technology has changed, at the top we have IMRT. So this is data out of Auckland in New Zealand. With number of patients being treated for IMRT in 2010 to 2016 has gone from less than 50 to 300. And the STAR recommends, recognises from the clinic's perspective they are now completely comfortable with what they're doing and the diamond means they're more comfortable actually change it and play with it in clinical practice. And so ART is adaptive radiotherapy and what we mean by that is let's say a patient's contour changes during treatment due to uh, the patient losing weight. You can actually adopt, adapt the therapy distribution, the radiation field, virtually in real time uh, as they are going through treatment. So we're getting another degree of freedom. We're getting the degree of freedom of time, which is increasing the complexity yet again. And so we're also seeing a, an increasing number of RT courses per year in this single facility. So this data is pretty, is pretty uh, indicative of New Zealand's experience. But interestingly, we're seeing fewer fractions because if we look with more advanced therapies with a greater dose per fraction, therefore require fewer, fewer fractions in total, you end up with a less, lesser number of fractions per RT course, which of course comes back again, this ability to correct if any errors are made along the way. And this is an example of the changing number of clinical practice and the prostate work on the, low, on the left, we have far more a definitive than palliative workload. We're in the right, we're looking at treating METs as they appear over time, as well as um, the, the first, first approach to therapy. But there's a change in practice 
because of technology, and that technology is impacting on the understanding of the radiation biology of patients as they front up for treatment. And now we have imaging. On the top left, we have, we'll say, old school CT with volumes, whoop, sorry, with volumes defined. So avoidance volumes, treatment volume. So avoidance is the, the blue, treatment is the green and the pink. We add some contrast in the middle. We add a bit of uh, gamma camera, nuclear medicine. Then we move down, we have MRI with volumes being delineated. Move down again, we have functional MRI. Move down again, then we have PET. So that all the information which is coming out of all this imaging is becoming more and more complex from an understanding of what is going on in the human body and what is trying to be treated and how do you throw all that together to understand how to treat. And again, drop this on top of course, what the field size is, what's the historical uh, behaviour of the patient and what's their existing radiological burden. So we're talking about different planning types. We also have the DICOM PAC system, which means you have an image bank going back possibly years, integral growth, but particularly we now have a multidisciplinary workforce which you need multiple impacts from multiple professionals to be able to inform the clinical decision and really inform justification. We're also looking at a lot more work going on remotely and semi-remotely, and these are actually existing apps which you can get on your phone and you can start making clinical decisions in the car, if maybe you shouldn't, but there it is. So the other thing that's worth noting is that radiation therapy is intrinsically dis uh, digital. Everything which is performed in radiotherapy is recorded digitally, which opens up very nicely to robotic therapies, to AI, and to sharing information across boundaries, across platforms, to be able to get multiple disciplinary engagement, independent of platform and pretty much independent of um, location. Now what I haven't talked about is immunotherapy. If Pepe was here, he would hopefully do that. This is outside my scope. I'm just going to say it's real, it's live, it's undetermined what it actually means, but there's a lot of promise. And there's a lot of references. So, the future of radiation college is very promising. There's all sorts of multi-dimensional imaging products which are coming into play, which are informing clinical decision. We're getting metastatic, metastatic uh, directed therapy to a larger extent now than ever before, and that has changed the clinical path. It's also changed the way treatment decisions are made because the patient has a radiation history, which historically has not necessarily been there. But of course, this is only happening because of the success of the treatment. We also need to look at uh, robotics and AI is absolutely coming. Radiation oncology is digital. And you pretty much, we have robotic delivered radiation therapy now. It's relatively uh, very cheap when you compare it to chemo and even to surgery. And that I think can be, uh, have a great attraction going forward. So we're probably looking at tumor adapted dose with changes in fractionation metastatic directed therapy, patient reported outcome measure, a PROM, so really we're now tracking individual patients against their individual treatment, and that is only going to become bigger and better. And the recognition that with the increased technology impacting on clinical decisions, the professional boundaries are starting to blur to an extent. So justification in the future requires a multidisciplinary approach to actually figuring out what is appropriate and understanding the detriment and the benefit. So thank you, uh, the ACDS, and I'd really like to plug the NCI's course which I went to about a month ago on epidemiology and dissymmetry because it has informed a quite, quite a fair bit of this presentation. So thank you. Thank you very much for this very inspiring talk and also for keeping your time which is perfect because now we can have time for questions. And in fact, we already received the first question from the audience for you. The question is, how do you propose to deal with proprietary algorithms or software systems that are designed in imaging impact overall dose to the patient? Okay, so it's not our job this is from peeking from our parents' perspective and with the Auditing National Service. 
We don't necessarily, and it's not our job, to tell people how to write algorithms. We don't tell people how to do their job. We're really there to tell people as well as we can, based on the statistical body of data, whether their algorithm is actually doing what they think it does and what the clinic thinks it does. So we're very wary of uh, actually identifying and we have engaged with clinical propriety owners of algorithms previously, but only after we've had a body of data that demonstrates that a given piece of software demonstrates an outcome which is significantly different from the national data set which we have obtained. Once you've got an operating national data service and it's got a bit of uh, experience under its belt, when you go out and measure a facility, you're no longer measuring it against yourself, you're measuring it against every other facility which you've already measured. So you get this ability to generate a body of data which is incredibly powerful because it is being a comparison of that facility against the entire country and possibly internationally. And as long as and as soon as you can uh, explain that to the people whom you are, being, who are, whom you are auditing, they recognise that it's not you really being uh, the dose police, you're being a comparator as well, and you can demonstrate how that algorithm behaves, where it falls down or doesn't, and where the risk spaces are, which can then again inform clinical practice. Sure. Thank you very much. We have another question. The improvement in delivery is therapy dose dependent uh, no, is therapy dose depends on multiple imaging. How does the increase in imaging impact the overall dose to the patient? So that very much depends upon the type of dose being used. Uh, there's absolutely a recognition that increased imaging, ionising radiation imaging impacts the dose burden to the entire patient, and this is where we come back again to the concept of justification. So if we're running a nuclear medicine procedure at the same time as the positive, well, say PET, the person has a PET camera, they might have a CT at the same time, that is the clinical decision pass line to recognise what is the radiation dose of those investigative procedures and what is the clinical impact, as in what's the positive, what's the diagnostic impact of running those procedures. And that is the equation which the clinical team needs to understand. Thank you. We still have two more questions and we have time. Uh, does Australia have a country standard for keeping radiation records? A pro sorry, a standard for keeping radiation records. This is the question. If okay. there is something different, this is what is written here. I'd almost actually ask Professor Murphy on that one. There, there, we do have health record requirements. There would also be local practice and requirements. Um, I probably need to get a bit more information on that one. There's going to be an initial... A, 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 a crucial set of data which is required to be held, but exactly what that is, I'm not sure. If we're talking about the electronic dose rep um, patient reporting system from a radiation safety perspective, we would like it to have more because there's critical information such as the header file in the CT data set, which is not at this point uploaded against the patient uh, history. We would like that, but that's a recognised uh, request which has been fed into the Department of Health and the overarching national program for the electronic medical record. This is, um, this is an endless string of data, which everyone from each profession, from every subspecialty would like more of, and it's an ongoing, probably infinite build space. Thank you. We have another question here. Looking at the future, what progress in dose estimates f you see, I understand, for non-targeted tissues, for instance, from the scatter radiation, etc.? Okay, so this is a really important question, and it is not answerable at this point in time. We don't know. I think that's fair to say. Uh, so we run a, st a primary standards laboratory, and the uncertainty that the head of that team is happy with is about 0.3% on the dose measurement at a K equals 1. And if you get him on a bad day, it's probably 0.1%, so K equals 3 at 0.3%. There's no method that I'm aware of that can accurately measure the dose inside a patient to that level of accuracy. So that's one point. Our chambers are calibrated to dose in water, 
or docent tissue on a LINAC beam or a cobalt beam, but it comes back against a graphite um, calorimeter, but basically on a dose to water concept. Human tissue is not water. The chambers which we colorate are colorated against water, so you need correction factors to then take them out and put them into a lung simulator type tissue. The efficacy and the accuracy of those correction factors is reasonable, but it's got Monte Carlo background to support it, but that also assumes that all lungs are the same. And they're not, we know they're not. We also have this historical issue of people's changing uh, anatomy and physiology over time. We have disease burden, we have scarring for radiotherapy, we have all this sort of stuff going on at the same time. This is a difficult question. We'll work on it more, and what it really comes back to is one of the large points is the patient information to recognise what are the clinical outcomes of different therapies against different uh, diagnostic imaging data sets. And we're pretty much, I suspect, going to look more about what has happened as a predictor of what will happen as distinct from a cold predictor. Thank you very much. Excellent. We could continue, but really now time is, is finished. But uh, thank you very much for this. <laughs>